have the letter. In August 20th of 1912, she writes, kindly give me whatever information you can in regard to the most up-to-date dairy methods and dairy building. She also requested they send her regularly the dairy bulletin that they publish. We have a response from the USDA at some point in the date, or this could indicate that Catherine had more than one letter to the USDA. Um, in response, they had sent her the circulars that she requested, and they also noticed that they had a request that the North Carolina agent, W.H. Eaton, would provide Catherine with any assistance that she may need during the planning phase of her new dairy building. So we know that the resultant Rinalda dairy was one of the most modern in the country. It ha had automatic milking machines. It had a separate white tile milking room that kept the milk separate from the rest of the barn and free of contaminants. During this time, a significant component of local farming was the dairy because tuberculosis was a leading cause of death and it was often transmitted through the milk of infected cows. So to Catherine, knowing the most scientific method was of extreme importance. So we know that by the time the summer of 1917 came around, the Twin City Sentinel came to Rinalda and it unveiled the achievements that Catherine had done and the work that was going on at Rinalda and it called it an experiment station. And it noted that many local farmers and dairymen were coming to Rinalda specifically to learn from its progress. And it wrote that Rinalda is destined to become one of the great factors in the development of farm life. It is already a model of progressive farmers, and many have made the trip for the sole purpose of looking over the splendid development and to study its methods. We know that Catherine was extremely involved. Um, she was actually, actually acting farm superintendent for a time. She had hired R.E. Snowden in 1911, but they soon parted ways about a year later. And for a time, Catherine was in charge, and she sent this letter to a friend where she writes, the farm is flourishing now, I am acting superintendent, and good management is beginning to tell. Um, this choice of punctuation is Catherine does not mean editorializing, she was sort of poking fun at her qualifications for managing a farm. So Catherine did not create Rinalda in a vacuum. She was very aware of what was happening in her community, and she wanted to design a farm that was addressing those real needs. The Renata reflected current progressive ideals through its site design, its scientific methods, and its role in agricultural extension work. And it's the agricultural extension work that I'm going to be focusing on today because that's where the corn club and canning club sort of fit into the picture at Renata. So did Catherine solicit these in particular from the USDA, or did the USDA include them along with other information they were sending? Catherine, we don't know. We know she got the dairy bulletins, although for whatever reason, those no longer exist in our collection. The only two pieces from the USDA are these corn clubs and canning clubs. So for some reason, Catherine's definitely deemed them important enough to hold on to. And it could very well be that these two um, clubs were very influential in improving farming throughout the South. In February of 1917, Professor E.C. Branson, who was a professor at UNC, and he spoke about the state of farming in Forsyth County. And he said, while your city, city flourishes, your farm regions languish. The simple fact is that Winston-Salem is not the center of a well-developed food-producing area. Forsyth County was the fastest growing county in North Carolina, but its agricultural growth was not keeping up with the progress that we were seeing with the industry and the cities. And Branson reported that in 1910, Forsyth County imported more than a billion bushels of western corn and corn products, and that 36% of farmers were having to also buy feed for their livestock. There were only 34 cows per 1,000 acres and only 41 swine per 1,000 acres. Branson also estimated that farmers were losing a million dollars a year but not raising additional food products at home, and they were losing yet another two million by failing to also sell those products on the market. The South was depending too much on the cash crops of either tobacco or cotton, and the variety of crops being grown was declining. In North Carolina, the number of farms grew steadily from 1865, and what this meant, there were more and more farms with fewer and fewer acreage. So this resulted in a number of small farms that were not large enough to be profitable on either a cash or even a subsistence basis. 
And the average net annual income from all North Carolina farm, farm crops in 1915 was only $230. And with the ever-growing popularity of bright leaf tobacco and how it spread through the South, proved to be particularly damaging. Tobacco has always been a part of Southern agriculture from the time of the Jamestown colony, but bright leaf initially brought new benefits and sort of why it became such a widespread problem. It actually does grow well on the poorest of soil. It sold initially for very high prices. It required very little in new mach machinery, building, or knowledge to build. It stimulated the manufacturing industry that was growing in the cities. And at the onset, it actually made a poor region rich, which sort of helped explain how what we now know to be a detriment to the environment was actually initially very beneficial to farmers. And as um, cigarette grew in popularity, it became even more important because Bright Leaf was used in all um, tobacco products, but in cigarettes in particular, smokers enjoyed the mild flavor and the flu curing process that Bright Leaf underwent meant that this type of tobacco transferred nicotine more efficiently to the human body. So ironically, bright leaf production actually conformed with early farm reform efforts that predated the Civil War in that it proved profitable. Reformers tended to preach sustainability uh, rooted in economics versus in conservation, and it was typical that reform efforts were adopted that proved economically beneficial. But within a few decades, bright leaf trans from being a savior to being a destroyer in these areas. Uh, many farmers had turned to Bright Leaf because they believed their land was not capable of growing other crops, and the irony being that after the years of following tobacco cultivation advice, their fear, fears actually became a reality. Um, when James B. Duke's American Tobacco Company created a virtual monopoly, cigarette producers began refusing to pay premium prices for the best tobacco, and it thus removed much of the farmer's incentive to focus on quality rather than quantity. So when faced with stiff competition and decreasing prices, farmers actually began to plant more and more bright leaves instead of looking to other uh, crops. Even after the tobacco trust was disbanded, market prices never uh, reached what they had once been. So it resulted in massive soil erosion and deforestation in the area. It led to a cycle of indebtedness as the land got more and more poor. Farmers invested in more and more commercial fertilizer, and it was a never-ending cycle. And it also continued a decades-old reliance on a single crash crop to the exclusive um, exclusion of any farm and economic diversity. So in 1919, Forsyth farms were still only producing a quarter of the food and feed supplies that they consumed. And a study done in 1915, farm wives reported that families were eating hot white biscuits, black coffee, and slightly cooked side meat three times a day. And this was a diet that they started in infancy. So farm reformers were well, well aware of the problems that were going on in the South in particular. And they wanted to focus on improved agricultural production, they wanted to encourage economic development, and they wanted to, to raise the quality of life for farmers but they had difficulty introducing any type of reform measures that would um, appeal to farmers and that they would actually follow through on. So as I mentioned a second ago, farm reform actually did begin before the Civil War. Uh, the most notable effort was the 1862 Moral Land Grant that established agricultural colleges. But after the war, very few farmers had the resource or interest to foster any sort of improved method, methods. Here in North Carolina, Leonidas L. Polk, who was the founder of the Progressive Farmer, along with other reformers, sought the creation of the Land Grant College, and the following year, um, what is now North Carolina State University was established. In that same year, the Hatch Act provided for agricultural experiment stations, and these were where farmers could go and visit a farm and see these new techniques in action. And this was really the beginning of what is termed farm dem demonstration work. And this sought to instruct through practical demonstration. In 1902, Seaman A. Knapp um, started a division of the USDA to bring this farm demonstration work to the South. But it wasn't until 1914 um, when the Smith Weaver Act created an actual federal network. So, um, extension work takes a variety of forms it can be agricultural colleges, experiment stations, or farmers' institutes. And what they found was that demonstration 
was the most successful method with farmers who were skeptical of academic and what they termed experts. So this is where corn clubs and canning clubs fit back into the picture. So one of the main goals of farm extension work is to link formal education with actual farm experiences. But how do you do that when your farmers are skeptical, skeptical of the academy and anyone who they perceive to be experts? They don't trust the knowledge. So corn clubs and corn contests began as early as the late 1800s as a way to reach young farmers. But William Paul Smith, who was superintendent of schools in Holmes County, Mississippi, actually gets the credit for introducing the first corn club in 1907 that fully cooperated with the educational system. So his idea was to create greater interest in the schools throughout his community by reaching the young boys who were attending the school. Um, this is again our, um, the copy of our circular. The corn club spread quickly throughout the South, and by 1909, 10,543 boys were enrolled nationwide. So why corn clubs? Um, this wording is lifted directly from the USDA, and it's what they were using to sell this new technique of learning. And it was, one, to afford the, the teacher a simple and easy method of teaching practical agriculture in the school to be of real service, mainly by actual work on the farm, to prove that there's more of the soil than the farm has ever gotten out of it, to inspire boys with the love of the land by showing them how they can get wealth out of it, by tilling it in a better way, and thus be helpful to the family and the neighborhood. And finally, to give the boys a definite, worthy purpose and to stimulate a friendly rivalry among them. The corn was selected because it was a plant that could be grown profitably in any part of the U.S. And most boys already had a common knowledge of the crop. And also, corn yields more food to the acre than any other grain crop. And the idea was that a good crop would mean cheaper food for both men and animals. They had a lot of rules for the corn club. The boys must be between 10 and 18 years of age. They had to become a member of the corn club to participate in any contest. And members had to agree to study the official instructions that were um, given by the farmer's cooperative demonstration work. Each boy had to plant his own crop and do his own work. He had to plant an acre of land and he had to cultivate it himself. They were provided seed in their first year, but in subsequent years they had to get their own seed. In the case of small boys, they actually allowed them to hire help for plowing and preparing the land, but then they had to account for that expense when they were figuring their profits at the end of the year. Because it was not just about who could produce the best crop, but learning about what techniques work best, and they also had to learn counting techniques and how to calculate their total expenses and how that fit into their overall profit. They were judged on the greatest yield per acre, the best exhibit of 10 ears of corn that they would exhibit in either a county or a state fair. They were judged on their best written account showing the history of their crop and the work that they had done and on the best showing of profit based on their investment. So the corn clubs followed the principle that had been established by extension work for, adult, for adults, to instruct, to direct, to guide, and to train. They really focused on showing and then letting the participant do and learn that way. So the object was the same as that aimed at adults, to secure the adoption of better methods of farming and greater yields at less cost. Many of the boys in, in the clubs who began to study agriculture in this way would continue to study in agricultural colleges, while other well, others would continue the efforts on the farm. And all of them would make useful and more efficient citizens. So the overall goal was really to create this population of farmers who grew up learning these scientific methods, and it became a thing that he learned because he needed it, not necessarily because he had any great love of education, but they wanted to make it clear that you need to know, have this knowledge to create a successful farm. There was a big emphasis on cooperation with the schools, with the community at large, and with the farm families. And a lot of local businesses were approached to contribute prizes to their local corn club. Prizes included trips to D.C., $50 in gold, a nice buggy, a first-class bicycle, a strong two-horse plow, a double-barreled shotgun, a gold watch, a hat, a suit of clothes, an up-to-date corn planter, fertilizer, a two-horse wagon, 
a pair of registered pigs, a pair of full-blooded chickens, a fine colt, a registered calf, and books on agriculture. So uh, most of the prizes were centered around just furthering this idea of farm education. So despite these tangible prizes that, be, that could be attained, which looked like a good hook, the Corn Club founders really believed that it was the success in helping their family farm and farms in their greater community that would be enough of an, of an incentive for boys to join the clubs. And this is another quote from the USDA circular that says, the wise and judicious producer can enjoy health, wealth, and contentment. Success is in, is in the work. Success in the work is good training for usefulness in any line. The question is, how many boys can be reached and influence thus to succeed? We also have a circular that the USDA published called Results of Boys Demonstration Demonstration work in corn clubs in 1910. So I'm going to assume that they produced these for several several years to show that these clubs were growing in popularity. In 1910, they reported that 46,225 boys had participated. You may remember that in 1909, a little over 10,000 were participating, so this is a big jump and that the average boy was producing 133.7 bushes per acre. This particular table is showing the top prize winners from 1910, and North Carolina made a list. Ernst Starnes from Hickory produced 140 acres. <clears throat> and the USDA would also report that the profits that these boys earned would allow several of them to attend school, and all except two of them have handled taking courses in agriculture. So in North Carolina, clubs came in 1906 when the North Carolina Farmers Institute offered prizes to boys for corn production, but they weren't official corn clubs. That didn't happen until July 1909 when the USDA signed a cooperative agreement with what is now NC State. And in that same year, the first club was established in Hartford County. Um, this is a 1945 photo taken it shows the remaining members of that first corn club in North Carolina, and they gathered for the dedication of an historical marker that went up for the corn club there. At the inauguration of the club in 1909, Ira Oshua, who was North Carolina's farm demonstration agent, said, better conditions in agriculture will be brought about as you boys study and apply yourselves to present to present day problems. The yield of corn in North Carolina is approximately 15 bushels bushels per acre. If you boys would like to do something about it, the Extension Service will help you organize a corn club and attempt to reach you to teach you how to increase the yield of corn. So he's saying that in 1909, the average North Carolina farm was only producing 15 bushels of corn per acre. And if you recall, in 1910, in Hickory, our stars was able to produce 140 bushels per acre. And all and the average for all participants was 133. So that is a huge impact on local agriculture. But this form of club extension work, work did not stop with corn and it did not stop with boys. In 1911, North Carolina hired Jane, Jane S. McKibben as the state's first home demonstration agent to start canning clubs for girls. And this is our girls demonstration work for canning clubs circular that we have. And this particular version that we own actually targets cotton growers and not tobacco growers, and it states in there that the problem of meeting the ravages of the cotton bowl weevil is now and always has been as much of an economic problem as it has been one of simply raising cotton with the weevil present. But diversification of crops and production of home supplies is the main way to prepare the farmer to meet the weevil. Um, in the same publication, um, USDA employee Stephen Knapp noted that it has been thought for several years that the development of the plan of the Farmers Cooperative Demonstration Work of the United States Department of Agriculture would be incomplete unless some work for the girls was inaugurated and organized. It was necessary, however, to thoroughly establish the other divisions of the work before taking up new lines. So once the boys finally got themselves sorted out, they moved on to education for girls. Girls' candy clubs were actually first established in South Carolina in 1910 because, I believe it was York County, because an enterprising teacher just kept at her superintendent, we need an opportunity for girls. And he finally <laughs> gave in and said, do what you want, and she formed the first tomato club. 
Um, clubs also popped up in the same year in Virginia, and about 325 girls were enrolled in that first year. By 1911, more than 3,000 girls from eight states had joined, and many of them put up 500 quart cans of produce apiece, while a few got nearly 1,000 cans. So why canning clubs? Again, this is direct wording from the USDA. And it was to stimulate interest and wholesome cooperation among members of the family and the home. It was to provide some means by which girls may earn money at home and at the same time get the education and viewpoint necessary for the ideal farm life. To encourage rural families to provide purer and better food at a lower cost and to utilize the surplus and otherwise what would be waste products of the garden and orchard. And it was to furnish teachers a plan for aiding their pupils and helping their communities. Um, I put up the two <laughs> official words from the USDA side by side, so you can see there's a bit of a gender difference in how the two clubs are described. The corn clubs had a stronger focus on st stimulating competition and gaining wealth, while the canning clubs were focused more on wholesome cooperation, and there was a bit more of an internal focus of helping the home. It's a bit more of an insular goal while the corn clubs were a little bit more far-reaching and aiding the surrounding neighborhood. And actually some girls insisted on joining corn clubs instead. Um, the men in charge thought, questioned whether the girls would be able to do the hard work required of the boys, but they persisted and they were able to join the corn clubs. Unfortunately, I was unable to find exactly what locality they were from and what their record of success was. Um, it was just an offhand comment by Seaman Knapp who noted that some girls were insisting on being in, in the corn clubs. So I mentioned that Jane McKimmon was hired as the first home demonstration agent in 1911, and she remained in her role through um, 1945. Um, I would encourage you to, if this is of any interest whatsoever, picking up her book that she published in 1946 called When We're Green, We Grow. She talked a lot about the history of home demonstration work, but she also talks about the role of women in the education system. And she talks about these agents who would come in would be assigned to a locality and they would be really enmeshed in their communities and they would travel around. And she talks about the experiences that these women had because they hired just women for um, the outreach to girls and women because they wanted um, the agents to be relatable, relatable to the farm families they were visiting. And she um, mentions it. They, the female farm agents had were on equal footing with the male agents, so it's probably um, a bit of a rare thing to happen in any sort of industry during this time period. So actually the General Education Board funded the first women agents and not the USDA. The USDA didn't take over funding of female agents until 1914 when the Smith-Weaver Act established a, a more um, organized system for governing home demonstration work. It was believed that growing a garden and canning vegetables might furnish the girl on the farm with an outlet for her energies. The canning clubs initially focused on tomatoes. The girls were meant to work a tenth of an acre, and then they would sell their tomatoes either fresh or canned. Most um, decided to sell canned because there was some confusion over uh, how to grade vegetables were selling them fresh and they weren't getting as much of a profit by trying to sell them fresh. So most did sell them canned. In the first year in North Carolina, they averaged a profit of four and a half cents per can with an average profit, profit of $14.57 per girl. Only tomatoes were allowed at first because they wanted to create standards in food con conservation and grading. And um, Jane McKimmon actually shares a funny story um, of a exhibit they did in the 1913 State Fair of some of the cans. They did tin canning, so this was all new. They weren't focused just on um, glass canning, which was more common to farm women, but actually like tin canning and soldering the cans. And there was some confusion over um, establishing the escape valve for the steam, and they had a lot of cans that were improperly um, canned. So at their exhibition at the State Fair, she didn't want to embarrass anyone, so she had like a little box behind the table where she was removing the damaged cans so no one like noticed. Um, they soon expanded to including all fruits and vegetables. They included soup mixtures and preserves. And by 1916, they were creating a dependable mar product for the market. Traditionally, merchants would not purchase home canned goods due to, as I said, just inconsistencies in how 
they were canned that would result in school products. But the candy clubs helped change this and it created a reputation for quality around home canned goods that really opened up yet another market for farm cream that was to sell more produce. And it was average that the efficient canner brought home an average of two to three hundred dollars a year for their canned products. Every girl who joins a club is urged to put forth her best efforts to learn and to become skillful. It is a good thing to know about the soil plants in nature. It is an accomplishment also to learn the arts of cooking and housekeeping. Artists in these lines are scarce and highly appreciated. A girl who does this work well for a year will take a decided step towards self-improvement and efficiency. It's interesting to note that here the USDA is lifting up the art of home domestic science to an art. It's not just Something that had to be done is not a drudgery. It's a place of accomplishment for young girls and women. So while girls were enjoying this expanded educational opportunity, women on farms were continuing to be neglected. A study was done in 1915 into the lives of farm, <clears throat> into the lives of farm wives and daughters, and they actually solicited, solicited input from the women themselves and they wrote in letters, either the women wrote them themselves, or if they couldn't, their husband were writing in the letter. So they had a, ch a chance to really express in their own words their, their needs for what they needed in their community. And it really focused, this findings focused on the need for increased education and a need for a social outlet. One woman wrote, no diversion in entertainment, nowhere to go, nothing to look forward to, just an endless round of toys. So what was decided from the study is that they needed to expand these club education opportunities to women. And some women had even written, I see in Candy Club work the beginning of social uplift, a faint dawn of household economics in some of the homes. So unlike the corn clubs that remained just for boys, the Candy Club soon began to include women. And North Carolina was actually a bit of a front runner because that study was done in 1915 but women's clubs were already established here in 1913. Um, Jane McKimmon wrote, they were hungry for the new experience of learning to do things through seeing, seeing them done, for the opportunity of coming together in interesting work, for the chance to produce an income, and for an outlet to express themselves and get recognition from. So again, you see this um, theme of women needing a way to express themselves. They learn better nutrition, they improve the sanitary conditions in their homes and kitchens, they added new sinks, they raised the height of their work tables, they learned that they needed increased storage space in their house, they added fireless cookers and isolated refrigerators, and they also learned better cleaning methods. They learned how to cut, fit, and make their own dresses, and as Jane McKimmon put it, they even learned how to make presentable hats. <laughs> so it was these canning clubs that were the center for farm extension work here in Ronaldo. Catherine tapped into this already existing educational system, and she used the state extension workers here at Ronaldo to, to have home demonstrations in dairy of canning, dairying, and cheese making. Ida Long, who was the director of the county canning home, and Lizzie Roddick, who was the director of home economics and domestic science in Forsyth, led the demonstrations in Ronaldo's dairy. Um, with the threat of food shortages during World War I, Ronaldo became a part of a national campaign to upgrade food production, and Catherine turned over the dairy and the steam pressure sterilizer to these local women, and, the, <clears throat> and with the help of a local home demonstration agent, they canned 44,000 quarts of fruits and vegetables in the summer of 1917. Um, the government provided all of the containers that were used in exchange for uh, first refusal in case the food was needed for army supplies. Otherwise, the food was to be distributed in industrial lunchrooms, hotels, and cafes. The event was a huge success, according to the local women, and Catherine actually planned similar, similar events to be held later in the year. Unfortunately, RJ's illness in the fall of 1917 halted Catherine's work at the farm. And his illness continued through the end of 1917, and he eventually died in July of 1918, and after his death, Catherine seemed to lose her enthusiasm for um, the farm. Local farmers could still come to Ronaldo to apply for information from the superintendent, A.C. Wharton, or the dairyman, T.J. Monroe, 
So the Ramana was still existing as this place where people could come and learn, but Catherine does not seem to have had an active participation, participation in farm demonstration work after 1918. But these clubs proved to be continuing in popularity, and they eventually branched out to include pigs, poultry, crop rotation, peanuts, cotton, and potatoes. Um, early on in 1911, O.H. Pinson introduced a slogan for these clubs, head, heart, hands, and hustle. Hustle was quickly changed to help, and the 4-H design was put on a clover, and this became the branding that was used by the canning clubs to market their goods. So if it had the, what we now know as the 4-H sign, on the canned goods, they were noting that this was done up to standard and was a quality product for purchase. So these clubs became the foundation of what we know as 4-H clubs today, that um, they were officially founded in North Carolina in January of 1926. These outreach efforts, both 4-H and the earlier iterations of corn and tomato clubs, extended to the African American population. And initially the clubs were seg segregated, but in many areas they found that it would benefit the community to actually integrate the clubs. And some areas were integrated as early as the 1930s. However, they did not become officially integrated in North Carolina until 1965. So if you are curious more about Ronaldo Farm, come out on October 29th. Ronaldo at 100 Ronaldo Farm is opening. It's the historical component of our fall exhibition season, and it will explore the full Ronaldo Farm story and examine the role it played in uh, farming in Forsyth County. It will open in the Northeast Evans Gallery in the house. So I will take questions, and I have the Corn Club and Canning Club brochures out, so if anyone wants a closer look, they can come up and take a look. Any questions? Yeah? We have a, a question from Facebook commenter. Uh, did, did any of the Reynolds children participate in the corn clubs or canning clubs? Did any of the Reynolds children participate in the yeah. corn and the canning or, or or clubs? Answers. Not that we know of. Um, they would have been a little too young to be participating at this time. This was happening in 1917. So like Mary would have been nine, so she was a little young 